What would you be willing to sacrifice for power? Would you be willing to give up everyone and everything that you ever cared about? Would you be willing to forsake your oaths and spit on the traditions and values that you once held sacred? Could you barter with your very soul? How far would you be willing to go to become a god amongst men? Uh, if this all sounds appealing to you and like something you'd be capable of doing, then which deity do you decide to dedicate yourself to? Because I'm just going to be honest, the gods of plague, blood, treachery, and excess all offer some pretty radical different customization options. I'm just being dramatic. Picking your chaos god is no different than picking your Harry Potter house. Except for, instead of it being a fun little house that teaches about ambition, kindness, intelligence, and courage, uh, it's a deranged chaos murder cult that preaches the value of treachery, degeneracy, entropy, and hatred. Now, few truly have what it takes to walk the Eightfold Path as a champion of chaos, to become a bloody, ruthless tyrant, a destroyer of worlds, and an avatar of the gods' unholy hatred. In this video, we're going to talk about what it truly means to be a champion of chaos, what the path looks like for them to go from aspiring champion to chaos lord, and eventually to demon prince. We're going to talk about the differences between the champions of each and every god, as well as what it means to be a champion of chaos undivided, as there's actually a lot of misconceptions with that one in particular. We're going to talk about all that and a whole lot more, but before we dive headfirst into the grimdark, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor and a quick peek into where I actually film all of my videos. Many of you might be surprised to realize this, but I film all of my videos in the back of my own childhood Warhammer store. It's actually kind of a dream come true for me and works out great because they had space they weren't using and the rent I pay helps keep the store's costs down. Only problem is, I don't have a kitchen here. Ordering out gets expensive fast, and the food's not always the best quality. But thankfully, there's Factor, the sponsor of this video. Their fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes and delivered right to your door. All you have to do is heat and enjoy, then go back to crushing your goals. Not only do they save me money by not having to order out when I'm in the studio, but at home, they also cut down on trips to the grocery store, saving me time. They have a rotating menu with over 35 weekly flavor-packed meals to choose from, with options for every lifestyle. Whether you're vegetarian, following a keto diet, or just a fan of good food. Now, personally, I like to go with the chef's choice option for my meal plan, as I like a wide variety of different types of foods. And between you and me, I didn't think I would like vegetarian or vegan food, but Factor made me a believer. And now, even though I don't personally follow those lifestyles, their meals are a regular part of my Factor rotation. I love that Factor's incredibly flexible as well. I can adjust my order size to include meals for a loved one or even skip a week if I know I have a special event coming up. Head to factor75.com or click on the link below and use code WESHAMMER50 to get 50% off your first box. Again, head on over to factor75.com or click the link below and use code WESHAMMER50 to get 50% off your first box. Big thanks to Factor for sponsoring this video. To the citizens of the Imperium, the Space Marines are not only viewed as quite literal angels, but are also considered to be one of the most dangerous and lethal entities that has ever existed within the physical universe. Each and every one of them a one-man army that is the end result of decades of strict martial training, copious hypno-indoctrination, and the legendary gene-forging techniques created by the Emperor of Mankind. They've each got two hearts, a third lung, the ability to regenerate from almost any injury, superhuman speed, strength, and can live for thousands of years. However, the Space Marines are not flawless, and though it is considered rare for one to turn renegade, when that does happen, when you take a veritable demigod and shatter the figurative chains of honor, duty, and tradition that bind them into eternal service, you are left with an abominable heretic that fights no longer to uphold the oaths they once held so sacred, but instead for a deranged lust for power and an insatiable selfish greed that they are cursed to never truly satisfy. These are the heretic Astartes, the ultimate traitors and one of mankind's oldest and most hated enemies. However, within the seemingly endless ranks of powered-armored heretics, a few notable warriors stand apart from their brothers as having been truly marked for greatness, their presence intimidating, their strength beyond what even their loyalist counterparts are capable of manifesting, and their hatred for the Imperium so palpable that it causes the gods themselves to stop and bear witness to their legendary deeds. These are the Chaos Champions, traditionally members of the Heretic Astartes that each possess traits of strength, cunning, and a lust for power so deeply rooted in their soul that they will be willing to sacrifice anything and everyone to further their ambitions and the profane agendas of the Dark Gods. 
Now, over their careers, these baleful conquerors will lead countless bloody raids across real space, drowning worlds in oceans of gore as they carve their blasphemous names upon the very stars themselves. Every decision they make, every life they take, and every world they burn will be done in full judgment of the ruinous powers. And if the champion is deemed worthy, they will ascend to demonhood, achieving immortality and power beyond comprehension, their blasphemous apotheosis causing reality itself to weep. If a man dedicates his life to good deeds and the welfare of others, he will die unthanked and unremembered. If he exercises his genius, bringing misery and death to billions, his name will echo through the millennia for a hundred lifetimes. Infamy is always preferable to ignominy. Now, much like how chaos by its very nature comes in infinite different forms, so too are all of its champions uniquely different. No two are exactly alike, and they all come from different backgrounds. Whether they have been from one legion or another, whether they were gene forged in the 41st millennium or they fought at the gates of Terra, whether they have usurped a previous champion, thus taking over their warband, or they clawed their way from nothing into a position of ultimate authority. Whatever their background, wherever they're from, each and every one of them has gained a considerable amount of experience, a host of unique skills to draw upon, and a plethora of knowledge over a wide array of different military techniques. A skilled champion knows how to utilize all of their talents in order to lead their brothers to victory in any given raid, campaign, or crusade, even if that means forsaking their preferred method of waging war. It is the Chaos Champions that act as the de facto leaders within a Traitor Astartes warband. And that's a task that's a lot easier said than done, as the inherent self-interested nature of being a follower of Chaos makes them notoriously difficult to control, and any alliance is seen as conditional and fractious at best. These champions are not given the honor of leading a warband or a unit within because of anything as trivial as rank or seniority for the tradition of appointed sergeants leading units in war died long ago. Free from their loyalist counterparts' adherence to militaristic dogma, the traitor Astartes have adopted, as they see it, a more natural, honest, and egalitarian philosophy. Strength is the only thing that matters, and everyone who walks the Eightfold Path is given a fair shot at power and the blessings of the Primordial Four. Because of their self-serving nature and the valuing of strength over everything else, heretic Astartes are naturally drawn to and led by the biggest, strongest, and most infamous of their kind. Now, although I'm sure they would take offense to the comparison, in this way, they function very similar to the orcs. And this makes a lot of sense when you think about it, not just because of the concept of the biggest and the strongest is the boss, which there's certainly some merit to, but a powerful warlord who has survived a thousand battles and led countless raids into real space promises to the individual that in following them, they will be provided with endless spoils of war, glorious unholy raids, and far more opportunities to bleed the hated enemy of the Imperium. When it comes to leadership displayed by the champions, it can manifest in a lot of different ways. Now, some champions choose to let their actions speak for themselves, while others loudly dedicate each and every victory to their respective patron of choice. Now, some may entice their followers to remain loyal through the promise of rich rewards, whether they be the physical spoils of war or the spiritual blessings of the gods, whereas others may simply rely on physical force and intimidation to ensure loyalty within their warband. Now, it's not uncommon for such champions to be viewed as the most feared individual on the battlefield, even while surrounded by towering demonic abominations. The most cunning of champions, however, utilize a variety of techniques to command respect, obedience, and dedication. Additionally, it's not enough for a champion to simply be a threatening combatant and a strong leader. In order for them to be successful, they must also possess a shrewd and cunning mind that is capable of discerning their foe's weakness whilst also identifying their own advantages. As is often the case with the followers of Chaos, they are vastly outnumbered and less well-equipped than their loyalist counterparts, most of them utilizing equipment that is either beyond ancient or was looted and scavenged from the bodies of their enemies. Because of this reality, the most successful Chaos champions are capable of identifying and creating situational advantages to give them an edge in battles they would otherwise have no hope of winning. 
Now, this may take the form of utilizing esoteric and underhanded tactics, conducting a well-timed unholy ritual or two, or by employing a dastardly clever use of limited resources to level the playing field at precisely the right moment. A champion who manages all of this without getting themselves killed will not only attract the attention of the Dark Gods, but also new followers from all of the other Chaos factions as well. As his personal power grows, so too will the strength and size of his warband. Now, all that being said, the reality is that the vast majority of champions will fail. They will be left dead in the dirt on some backwater world, their legacy lost and forgotten. Whether this be by offending their patron deity at the worst possible moment, being slain by a loyalist hero that they underestimated, or as is all too common with the forces of chaos, failing to identify and neutralize an enemy within their own ranks, an envious viper that had come to covet their position and power. The rewards that the gods choose to bestow on their most worthy of servants can come in an infinite variety of different forms, and admittedly, their use and function isn't always immediately obvious. In fact, most of the time when a champion has been blessed, they may not even realize it until several months or years later. It's not like they win some important victory in the name of the gods, and in their moment of triumph, suddenly a bunch of razor-limbed appendages come bursting out of their back. It's far more subtle than that. For most blessings, when they first begin to manifest, they might not appear like much of anything at all, oftentimes appearing as a small welt, blemish, or stigmata that becomes more pronounced over time. As these gifts begin to develop, they may cause hideously disfiguring mutations, like the sprouting of extra limbs, hands and arms twisting into demonic appendages, razor-sharp horns protruding from their skull, an expanding throat capable of spitting corrosive bile, ears capable of hearing the heartbeat of enemies laying in ambush over a mile away, or even a rotting, disgusting body that is so swollen with demonic disease that it weakens all of those in their vicinity. They may not appear as a physical manifestation at all, many empowering the Marines' internal body structure or elevating their minds. They may twist the champion into a blood-crazed butcher, swollen with unholy strength, or they may grant them a sense of charisma that causes all men that hear their words to follow their orders unquestioned. Most humans that witness such mutation would rightfully be horrified. Even the champions themselves often do not initially understand their worth, sometimes misinterpreting the gift as a curse. In time, however, after they have fully manifested, the power they bestow their wielder will eventually be fully revealed. But even still, the champion in question may not like what they get, but you don't get to pick and choose your blessings, and sometimes the gods can be fickle and display traits of a particularly cruel and wicked sense of humor. It's a really short excerpt, but there was a scene in the Lords of Silence that I thought was kind of enlightening on this, wherein a member of the Death Guard known as Vorks is carrying a Nurgling in his arms and has a moment of doubt about one of the Grandfather's gifts. He works his way down a long spiral stair, wheezing as he goes. His lungs are half full of fluid and he cannot help but think it is a poor gift. Then again, he has thought other gifts were poor in the past, only to discover their genius much later. Forgive, he says, speaking softly to the little lord at his elbow. The tiny demon giggles, then farts liquidly into the crook of his armor. That counts as forgiveness, probably. Although at times a champion may have received multiple blessings from different gods, it is far more common, however, for one to pursue the path of one deity in particular, every new blessing that is bestowed upon them being more powerful than the last. There are a ton of different types of Chaos Champions, and in reality, the term itself, Champion, is kind of a nebulous catch-all term that tends to get applied pretty broadly. For all intents and purposes, an Aspiring Champion and a Chaos Champion are exactly the same thing, for all Champions of Chaos are aspiring to be more powerful than they currently are. When we see terms in the Codex like Terminator Champion, Biker Champion, Havoc Champion, etc., etc., these are not ranks and are normally just there to differentiate what type of unit they are attached to. However, this isn't to say that all Chaos Champions are exactly the same thing. Far from it. In fact, there are several that we can point to that are distinctly different and stand apart from their peers. Every Champion of Chaos has to begin their journey somewhere, and many of them have yet to fully draw the attention of the Ruinous Powers, leading many of them to have only received a small handful of minor blessings, if any at all. 
By comparison, the exalted champions are individuals that have amassed such a considerable amount of unholy boons and warp-induced mutation that their mere presence can cause heretics to fight harder than they ever have before, despite the odds that may be stacked against them. These blasphemous warriors of legend are said to have the full attention of the gods and radiate an invigorating aura of unholy strength, each and every one of them an incredibly lethal combatant that serves as a beacon for the gods' blessings, a living icon of unholy faith. By simply being in their presence, all of their allies are inspired to ever more brutal and deranged acts of savagery and brutality. Now, inspiring figures like this exist for the loyalist as well, but whereas they tend to radiate a holy aura that instills in their allies a righteous second wind that reminds them of their duty, honor, and teachings of their chapter, the exalted champion inspires their allies by directly appealing to their selfish nature, for each and every one of them desperately seeks to one day be as favored by the gods as the exalted champion himself. Now, given their nature as a particularly powerful and influential figure, the Exalted Champions often take on a role similar to that of a lieutenant for a Chaos Lord. Traditionally speaking, a Chaos Lord is a champion that has been exalted to the point where they lead an entire warband, whereas aspiring champions lead all of the units within that warband. As I mentioned previously, there is no real formal system of rank that is common throughout all of the Chaos Legions, though it is traditionally assumed that with the exception of a Demon Prince, a Chaos Lord is the highest and most exalted form of a Chaos Champion. These are individuals whose goals are far loftier and more deranged than any of their champion counterparts. Each and every one an intimidating warrior of myth and legend, driven onwards to bleed the stars themselves by ferocious pride and relentless ambition. The Chaos Lords are proven leader figures who possess a combination of unholy strength and an indomitable will. They are often found leading massive warbands, pirate fleets, entire Chaos-controlled worlds, or at times have even been appointed to lead a Black Crusade against the Imperium. They are tyrannical warrior kings who bathe in the blood of entire worlds and are often responsible for the destruction or enslavement of entire star systems. The combination of their Astartes gene augmentation, a bevy of unholy blessings, and millennia of experience make each and every Chaos Lord an incredibly lethal opponent. Some may choose to take to the field wielding massive chain axes that eviscerate hordes of enemies into a crimson tide of viscera and gore whereas others may choose to wield powerful arcane weaponry or ancient combi weapons that can sunder even the heaviest of armors, or they may wield unholy demonic melee weapons that lash out in a screaming arc to bisect enemy vehicles or hack through any defensive barricade that the servants of the Corpse Emperor would dare attempt to hide behind. The Chaos Lords are conquerors of worlds that prefer to lead from the front, wherein they can be set loose to inflict the maximum amount of carnage earn the most glory, and most importantly, take for themselves the greatest spoils of war. For every single Chaos Lord that exists, there are hundreds if not thousands of champions that are envious of their position, and sometimes their envy can turn murderous. Many of them remain undetected, keeping their treacherous ambitions hidden until they get close enough to the Lord to stab them in the back, or have garnered enough support amongst their allies to stage a mutiny. However, at this point, traitors amongst traitors is something of a cliché, something that any Chaos Lord worth his salt has seen a million times before. And quite often, they can't even be bothered to deal with these usurpers themselves. When one is found out, the Chaos Lord will often send a particular champion, known as the Master of Executions, to swiftly eliminate the threat. As if there's one thing these guys are particularly good at, it's taking skulls. In battle, these single-minded champions will focus solely on the task of gruesomely decapitating enemy leaders. In a sense, they kind of act like a Chaos Space Marine version of an assassin, one that doesn't waste time trying to hide or lurk around in the shadows like a coward. They march straight across the field, brandishing a massive oversized axe, ready to take some heads and add to their grisly collection. The blessings they have received give them the remarkable ability to detect the soul flare of individuals with a particularly strong charismatic aura, whether they be warriors of renown, inspiring leader figures, or learned advisors. 
They will utilize their sorceress abilities to track the location of these individuals, even in the most chaotic of battlefields. And every step they take is done with the express purpose of closing the distance between them and their prey. With every successful decapitation they deliver, they in turn gain even more favor with the Dark Gods. The further along the Eightfold Path a Champion of Chaos treads, the higher the probability becomes that they will find themselves, whether intentionally or unintentionally, aligned with one of the four Chaos Gods. This can happen because their own personal philosophy of war aligns better with one god over the others, or, as is more often the case, the actions they choose to take end up furthering the goals of one god in particular. Champions that tend to utilize biological warfare in their raids will subsequently court Nurgle's favor, whereas champions that become obsessed with the spilling of blood and gory close-range warfare in all its forms will tend to inadvertently aid Korn and thus win his favor. Earning favor from the gods is not something that is mutually exclusive. One champion's raids or devilish pursuits may end up pushing the agendas of multiple gods simultaneously. Whereas on the opposite end of the spectrum, certain actions may gain favor from one deity while reducing their standing with another. Now, if you think about it in game terms, it's that every single action increases or reduces your reputation with the four different chaos gods. Sometimes everybody likes the thing that you did, whereas other times, the exact opposite is true and they all hated it. There are even those that are said to be champions of Chaos Undivided, and whereas this is traditionally believed to be the most common type of Chaos Champion, the truth is actually kind of the exact opposite. Earning the favor of all of the gods simultaneously is an incredibly difficult thing to do. But we'll circle back around to that in a little bit. As a champion continues down their path and earns more and more favor from their god, they will be bestowed with a ton of different unholy blessings and deadly mutations, and after they have earned enough of these, we can start to distinguish them as a champion of one particular patron. Now, those who walk the path of Nurgle are perhaps the most physically mutated of all of the Chaos Champions. Each and every one of them is a lumbering, filth-encrusted hulk, whose body has become a twisted and bloated sack of gas, rancid organs, and putrid fat their physical form becoming an incubator for thousands of demonic diseases and parasites. Now, whereas any of us would take one look at these fetid abominations and be rightfully disgusted, to the champions of Nurgle, they view each and every pox, bubel, and infection as a glorious gift from the Grandfather. They are virtually immune to damage, know nothing of pain, and their rotund appearance disguises a truly monstrous physical strength. The champions of Nurgle rejoice in the grotesque splendor of their physical transformation and take an enormous amount of pride in their endless work to spread entropy and disease across the galaxy in Nurgle's name. Now, all of the blessings bestowed upon a champion of Korn, however, are designed to increase their physical strength to inhuman levels, as well as ignite within them a wrath so intense that it clouds their vision and judgment to the point where the only thing they care about is the brutal slaughter of the enemy. Each and every one of these champions is a mountain of corded muscle that is coated in eons of gore. They butcher their way across the battlefield like a vicious hurricane of thrashing blades and armored fists. It's important to bear in mind, though, that the majority of these champions are not mindless savages, and many possess a keen intellect specifically tailored to the art of war. Many have made the mistake in the past of viewing a champion of Korn's warband as little more than a bunch of blood-drunk savages and severely underestimated their martial prowess. If few who make this mistake live long enough to correct it. The champions of Zinch, on the other hand, are individuals who pursue power and forbidden knowledge above everything else. Such champions have been blessed by the changer of ways and gifted with a whole host of supernatural abilities. These mutations often taking the form of the ability to predict the future, giving them a glimpse into the actions of their foes long before they even think of them. They may also take the form of physical mutations, such as a halo of dark flames, a third eye, or a crystalline body that flickers with the screaming faces of their defeated enemies. By and large, the champions of Zinch are some of the most powerful sorcerers that have ever blighted the physical universe. And though they may lack the tenacity of their Nurgle-aligned cousins or the physical strength of the champions of Korn, they by far make up for this with ludicrous levels of intelligence and access to forbidden sorcery that can melt charging armies into nothing less than bubbling slime, or mutate their allies into twisted abominations that rip and tear their way through the enemy ranks. 
Slaanesh is the god of excess in all of its forms, and thus they bless their champions with a whole host of mutations that are designed to help them better savor the sensations of war. Enhanced hearing, reflexes, speed, and a mind that can process information hundreds of times faster than other champions. Now, on the battlefield, they are a whirlwind of excess, their bodies moving so quickly that their enemies can barely keep track of their movements, while their mind, which is used to operating on such a profound level of constant excess, is capable of reacting to the most minute of muscle twitches or eye movements. This often translates to a one-sided battle, where in the precise microsecond the enemy decides on their next attack, the champion of Slaanesh has already positioned themselves to deflect it, whilst also following up with a counter. In addition to the champions dedicated to the four ruinous powers, we also have what is referred to as Champions of Chaos Undivided. And I'm going to take a few more minutes with this section over the others, as I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what it truly means to be undivided and I want to highlight just how rare of a thing this actually is. When we read about 40k, especially when we're getting into the tabletop game, we often look at being unaligned or chaos undivided as simply the fifth option when it comes to devotion to chaos. We see it as just as equal, viable, and powerful as devotion to any one god. And this notion isn't entirely untrue, but it gets a little bit complicated. A chaos by its very nature is self-serving. Chaos warriors will often pursue actions driven by their own anger, jealousy, spite, or greed, with no desire to push the agenda of any god or the pantheon at all. The vast majority of what we would consider standard Chaos Space Marines actually fall into this undivided category. Whether this be an intentional decision, like with the Chaos Space Marines of the Wordbearers Legion, that preach that each and every god is an important aspect of the entire pantheon or an unintentional decision wherein you have something like, say, a Chaos Space Marine from the Night Lords who may not care much about aspects of the supernatural or metaphysical at all, and just indulges in whatever they want, their actions often favoring one god over the other without any real direction or conscious choice. When I say that being undivided is something that is hard to do, it's when we're specifically talking about Chaos Champions that are on the path to eventually become a Demon Prince. You gotta remember that the Chaos Gods, although have been willing to set aside their differences briefly in the past, if for the most part, absolutely despise each other. They see each of their siblings as their mortal enemy, and they have no desire to share their champions. In order for somebody to be truly undivided, they have to commit deeds and actions that in no way favor one of the gods over the other. This can get incredibly tricky, because it's not as simple as winning a particular battle by using techniques favored by all of the gods. It's literally everything that you do, every thought that you have, every action that you take, every word that you speak. All of these things are being judged by the ruinous powers. Being able to perfectly balance your favor with each deity is a nearly impossible task, and the vast majority of champions, whether realizing it or not, actually have more favor with one god over the others. These champions may believe that they are undivided without realizing just how skewed their balance of favor actually is, and some may have even started down the path of one god in particular before eventually changing to another. It's something that the gods also take notice of and don't like. They can be incredibly petty and will often take vengeance on those that choose to leave their service. It's pretty easy to understand how to wage war in a way that a single deity appreciates, but I'm just going to be honest with you, the notion of having to make sure every single decision that I make and action that I take doesn't do anything to piss off any one god, and is somehow exactly what each and every one of them would want, is an absolutely exhausting mental effort, especially when Zinch gets involved. You might think you've done it. You might think you've come up with the absolute perfect solution to any problem set before you, that you will in no way anger any of the gods, only to find out that the reality is each and every one of them is pissed off that you even for a moment stop to consider the wants and needs of their hated siblings. Now, all that being said, it has happened in the past. There are champions of Chaos Undivided. And when this happens, they will be granted boons and powers from all of the gods in one way, shape, or form. But in refusing to align with any one deity in particular, they forsake their most powerful abilities. A champion of Chaos Undivided will never be as strong as a champion of Korn, 
never as durable as a champion of Nurgle, never as intelligent as a champion of Zinch, and never as fast as a champion of Slaanesh. This isn't to say that it doesn't come with some benefits. At first and foremost, this combination of blessings will make a champion of Chaos Undivided a particularly versatile threat. And due to their nature as an ironically balanced champion of Chaos, they have far more influence when it comes to uniting units and warbands dedicated to different gods. If somehow managing to balance the favor of all of the gods simultaneously wasn't hard enough, the most difficult hurdle a Champion of Chaos Undivided will eventually have to overcome is that of Apotheosis. For most Chaos Champions, the eventual goal is to ascend to demonhood, thus gaining immortality. This is their ultimate objective. However, for this to happen requires the direct intervention of a god. Now, normally, when a Chaos Space Marine reaches the point where they're eligible for ascension, they have become unbelievably bloated with gift upon gift and mutation upon mutation. It is at this point where they will eventually turn into a gibbering chaos spawn unless their patron directly intervenes. And if up until this point they've remained completely undivided and don't have a god willing to step forward and turn them into a demon prince, their journey will likely end in spawndom. When it comes to undivided demon princes in particular, their lore gets kind of murky. Bellicor is said to be the only undivided demon prince that the gods ever collaborated on and it was said to have been a failed experiment, so they never did it again. However, we also know that Primarchs such as Lorgar and Perturabo have ascended to demonhood, but as those two characters have yet to return to the setting, we don't really know what that process looked like. I'm sure it will be expanded upon further when they inevitably get models in 40k, but until then, we don't really have a lot of concrete answers. There's also the entity known as Vashtor the Archiphane, but he's more considered to be a lesser chaos deity that aspires to surpass the main four in power and influence. As far as I'm aware, Vastor was never a mortal, and it isn't exactly the same thing. When I make these videos, I try not to speak too much in game terms, as Warhammer is so much more than just a tabletop game. But a lot of its lore does have roots in the gaming experience, and thus it actually makes it easier to understand some of its concepts when you think in terms of a game. And Chaos Undivided is no different. It's like any other RPG. You've got a bunch of points to spread around between all of the gods, but you don't have an endless supply of them. If you put an equal amount in all four of them, you're never going to reach your capstone skills all the way at the top of the tree. A build like that can certainly be viable, but it's very often not the meta, and more trouble than it's worth. And that's kind of the point of being undivided. Not only is it incredibly difficult to actually achieve, but you're trading off raw power in a focused build in exchange for versatility. Before we close this video out, I want to touch on Demon Princes briefly as they are one of the most iconic Chaos units within all of 40k, and I believe they deserve their own dedicated video. But as Demonhood is the ultimate goal of any Chaos Champion, to better understand the champions themselves, we have to know what they are actually fighting for, what becoming a full-fledged demon really looks like. For those who walk the Eightfold Path, Apotheosis and Ascending to Demonhood is considered the ultimate objective. And this is for a lot of different reasons. Now, first and foremost, the power boost that they would get from becoming a demon prince is simply astronomical. Their bodies swell to be much larger than they were before, and every single aspect of all of the blessings they have received are magnified tenfold. Their power is so ridiculous that on backwater worlds across the galaxy, many have been worshipped as deities. A demon prince of Korn, for example, is no longer simply an incredibly powerful combatant, but a god of war in his own right. A demon prince of Nurgle is not simply a herald of disease and a walking ground zero for a host of contagions, but the rotting death of the universe given physical form. A demon prince of Slaanesh doesn't simply manipulate people, factions, and individual planets, but through their beguiling and demonic influence can bend entire sectors to their will. And a demon prince of Zinch is no longer simply an incredibly powerful sorcerer, but the nature of change itself, a creature that can warp and twist reality to its will. They are one of the most dangerous and powerful entities that has ever existed in both the physical and immaterial universe, as they are a perfect symbiosis of the best traits of both realms. They hold on to all of the guile, skill, and experience that they have gained in life as a mortal, while being directly infused with the overwhelming power of a demon. 
Now, this fusion results in a creature of nightmare, a paragon of evil in all of its forms that radiates an aura of pure terror and power. In combination with their new ludicrous abilities, as a demon, they are immortal. Upon their death, they will simply return to the warp where they will eventually be reformed by their god and sent back out to continue wreaking havoc in their name. And additionally, if we think about it, Apotheosis has an enormous amount of spiritual significance for a Chaos Space Marine that has dedicated their entire existence to serving a god. I cannot possibly think of a greater sign of a deity's approval than them directly interfering on your behalf, welcoming you into their kingdom, and remaking you in their own image. Also, it's no small task to accept demonhood either. For whilst operating as a Chaos Champion, they still have at least a small degree of separation between themselves and their god of choice. They are simply a tool used by the Ruinous Powers to spread their influence and push their agendas. But once they become a Demon Prince, that's it. They operate like all other demons, and it is said that demons exist as a minuscule portion of the god that created them. This rule extends to the Demon Princes as well. They are no longer simply a tool, but a direct extension of their patron. The followers of the Corpse Emperor have a saying that only in death does duty end. For the Chaos Champion that would ascend to demonhood, however, death no longer offers any respite. Once they become a demon, they now fully and truly belong to their god. There is no longer a chance of escape. The only thing that is left for them is an eternity of slaughter and madness, forced to do their god's bidding for eons to come. This is perhaps the ultimate irony that the Champions of Chaos face, that after a life spent slaughtering untold millions and burning dozens of worlds in exchange for power, once they finally achieve it, once they finally gain the immortality that they have fought for for so long, they realize that apotheosis isn't so much about what they're gaining, but what they're giving up.